everyone, welcome to the Dan Henschel Podcast. There are two things that I want to say to start this episode off. Number one is, I'm sorry. I'm sorry that I didn't do an episode of the podcast in four weeks. That was my bad. Number two is, fuck you. Because I don't think anybody even noticed. And if they did notice, they certainly didn't give a shit because nobody said a single thing to me in any capacity about the fact that there hadn't been a podcast in four weeks. So I want to ask you so-called supporters one question. Riddle me this. How is that supposed to make me feel? Answer me. How am I supposed to feel valued in this relationship if you don't even lift a single finger to show me you care about me? I was sitting at the Thanksgiving table and I just started crying in front of everybody because I'm looking at all these goobers who are so happy talking about all the things they have to be thankful for in their great lives. And then it got to my turn and I was just kind of stammering because I realized I have nothing to be thankful for. And I told everybody, I'm getting out of here. I'm not gonna humiliate myself like this. I'm not gonna sit here while you all stuff your face with shitty food and celebrate how great your lives are. It must be nice, I'll say that. Must be nice not having to constantly live with the feeling that nobody on earth cares about you. I can't even imagine the types of things I'd be able to do if I felt like anyone loved or cared about me in any way. It's like being a stage four cancer patient. Actually, it's worse because at least when you have cancer, people care about you. So happy Thanksgiving, I guess, but even saying that just feels like some sort of sick joke that I'm not laughing at. Thank God everybody finally dropped the act and they stopped pretending they give a shit about their stupid family and started celebrating the one thing they actually care about, buying stuff. Black Friday was even worse for me than Thanksgiving was. I woke up so hungover yesterday and I get out of bed and I realize my floor is covered in broken glass and blood because I had been up until four in the morning punching framed pictures of my family, which I only knew about, by the way, because apparently I had gone live the whole time on Instagram. I didn't even bother to clean it up because I knew I'll probably just do the exact same thing the next night anyway. But even after all that, after all that, stupid, stupid me, this is proof that I'm nothing more than a masochist because the monkey brain inside me still had a teeny tiny little glimmer of hope where I said, you know what? Maybe there's that one banana out there I can have today that won't make me feel like I'd be better off duct taping a bag over my own head and locking myself in the closet. I know that I have more than one cinephile in my audience, quote unquote, Sometimes what you need most on a bad day is a good film. Something that can take you to a totally different world for two hours or more and maybe make you think, hey, you know what, at least my life's not as bad as that guy's. At least I'm not stuck in a saw trap, although I suppose one could argue that life itself is one, but nevertheless, this did kind of prick my ears a little bit. I said, okay, here we go. Maybe cinema is going to save the day again because there's no feeling on earth like searching your zip code plus showtimes on Google and waiting for that loading screen to tell you which fantastical new world you're going to be transported to today. Which I must say was quite difficult because most movies now are just designed to be put on in the background while you finger bang someone, but I did eventually find one that looked interesting and I bought a ticket. Unfortunately, this is where it all started to go horribly wrong for me because the most convenient showtime was at a theater in L.A. called Universal AMC City Walk Hollywood. And I didn't really think too much of the name of the time. Well, I guess I did. I thought that's kind of a weird name, but I figured maybe they're just doing that as part of some tax evasion scheme or whatever. It was in the Valley, which is a part of L.A. that most people know better than to ever go to. And normally I wouldn't touch it with a 10 foot pole either. But because it was the day after Thanksgiving, I figured there's probably not going to be a lot of people on the road and there's not going to be a lot of traffic. If there's ever a day to go out there, today is the day to do it. So I bought a ticket, which was 14 bucks. I have to say a pretty good deal. That's matinee pricing. So, so far, so good. I drive out there and I realize that the movie theater is inside of a theme park. And I hate theme parks because I don't like when people try to manufacture an experience for me because I'm not a child. I know that that's not Mickey Mouse in that stupid costume. And even if it was, 
I spent all, all of my last spring trying to get rid of the rats that were crawling around behind my bathroom wall. So the last thing I want to see now is one dressed in a tuxedo like a jackass trying to be the funniest guy in the room. Now, the first question you should ask when you go anywhere in LA is always, where am I going to park? And the answer to that question often determines whether you go or not. So I drove around until I found a guy who looked like he was probably a service worker. And I rolled down my window and said, where the fuck do you people expect me to park? And he said, if you're going to the movie theater, you can just park in general parking like everybody else. So I said, okay, fine. Not ideal, but easy enough. General parking. I get in line. And immediately I realized this is going to take forever because it's the worst possible case scenario because everybody's happy to be there. It's a theme park and there's nothing worse than when a parking attendant is in a good mood and doesn't hate their life because then they take forever trying to talk to everybody. It's doubly worse if the people in the cars are happy to be there because then they want the parking attendant to be their own personal grandma slash tour guide like they're the first person ever come here. So I laid on my horn and I screamed at the top of my lungs out the window, you stupid fucks, move your fucking ass. There's other people in the world that aren't your shitty children. Stop being selfish and let me through. All these cars are full of people's stupid families trying to have a good time like their kid isn't just going to grow up traumatized anyway because you're both alcoholics. Finally, I get to the front. And immediately I say to the parking guy, shut up and listen to me. Here's how this is going to go. You're going to tell me where to park in five seconds or less as soon as I stop talking. And if you go a single second over, I'm going to turn the car around and floor it straight into your parking stand. This guy has the nerve to tell me that I have to pay $30 to park here. And I said, no, 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 it's not. You don't understand. I'm not one of these brain dead morons who's here to see your intellectual property strip mall. I'm a normal person. I'm just here to see a movie. Just let me through like I deserve. He says, okay, well, you're going to still have to pay me $30, but go to the desk at the movie theater. They'll give you a rebate for parking. So they'll give you $25 back out of the cash register if you show them your movie ticket. And then that way parking is only $5. So I said, oh my gosh, thank you so much, Isis, for holding me hostage here. I'm going to have so much fun. At this point, I'm 30 minutes late to the movie. So I don't even want to go anymore. But now I have to, to get my $25 back. All I wanted to do was quietly see a movie by myself. And now I'm being forced to go through the process of going to Disney World, which means I've got to find parking somewhere in this parking garage that's the size of most European neighborhoods and then walk through Mickey Mouse's whorehouse to find out which chicken coop they're holding my money at gunpoint. And at this point, I just want to get out of there and go home but I'm boxed in from every angle by these herds of grazing morons looking around in amazement because apparently they've never seen party city decorations before. Now I'm crying and screaming, just please get out of my way. I hate all of you. I hate this place. I hate my life. I wish I had died in a car accident on the way here. Finally, I get to the theater but once again, I'm stuck in a line of people who each want to talk personally to the box office person about the concept of a movie theater. I go in, and once I'm actually in the building, I start to realize why this entire situation is striking such a powerful nerve with me. Because cinema is supposed to be sacred. And yet, here I am watching it get wedged in between Mickey Mouse's ass cheeks. And you're probably thinking, well, Dan, then why don't you go to one of your pretentious douchebag theaters? There's plenty in LA. Go to Alamo Draft House, and that way you and all the other miserable film bros can leave the rest of us normal people alone. Well, guess what? They're even worse. Because at least the people who go to an AMC are fully transparent about the fact that they're only there because they need a dark room away from their parents to give each other hand jobs. A theater like Alamo Draft House has the nerve to bill itself as a place for film lovers, and then midway through the quietest part of the movie, they barge in and say, who ordered the mozzarella sticks? Nevertheless, I go to the concession stand guy and listen, I get it. I used to work at a movie theater. I used to smoke so much weed I thought I was in the Lorax. 
I know how it goes when your manager asks you at the end of your shift, why is your cash register 75 cents short? And the whole time you didn't even realize it was a cash register. I'm sure that he was doing the best he could given what I'm sure his circumstances were at the time. So I won't harp on that part too much. What I do want to emphasize here is the impossible situation that these corporations put these people in because AMC is a movie theater chain that is pretty close to owning every single movie theater in America because it's a long story. We had a pretty fun thing going over here in the early 20th century and then it just sort of got out of control and now it's too late to fix it. Point is, like every other corporation in America, now they can just kind of do whatever they want and nobody's going to stop them and our only two choices are suck it up or move to Switzerland and it's too cold there for me, so here we are. I'm going to explain this next part purely because of how stupid it is and I'm going to make a Dan Henschel promise that it is not an ad because it's going to sound like it, but I have to explain the way it works to you so you understand why it is the dumbest, most insane manifestation of corporate greed tearing apart the fabric of our society. The rules in our culture have always been when a lot of people want the same thing at the same place, you form a line in the order you showed up and you wait your turn. This is the way that it's worked for thousands of years until 2018 when AMC introduced a subscription service called AMC Stubs. The highest tier of AMC Stubs is called A-List and one of the perks is that you get to cut in line in front of everyone else. How you could be such an entitled jackass that you would be able to live with yourself for actually doing this, I have no clue, but apparently it is possible because I'm standing there in front of the line. Keep in mind, I've had the worst day of my life. You can see it plainly on my face. And the lady says, next AMC Stubbs A-list member. So some random guy and his idiot friends who just got there get to go before me even though I've been waiting for 20 minutes. Once again, it's this philosophy people have when they go somewhere where they think they're the first person who's ever been to this place before and so they need the person helping them to personally guide them through every single step of the experience. I used to be a host at a restaurant and people would come in all the time with the same dumb look on their face like they just crash landed outside from Mars and went in the first door they saw. And now I have to walk them through every step of the process of how going to a restaurant works. Once you see this mentality that people have, you can't unsee it because people literally do it everywhere. If you're subscribed to this podcast, then you understand this. I am a very nice person. I'm kind, I'm patient, I'm gentle, I'm a tender lover, but I'm looking at these people take 20 minutes to figure out how buying something works and I'm getting closer and closer to my breaking point. And we all know what happens when a white man in his late 20s reaches his breaking point. So I'm trying as best as I can to keep it cool. Then. The guy finally admits he's not even an AMC Subs A-List Rewards Club member. And 10 minutes ago, that sentence would have meant nothing to me. But now, that was the same as him saying, Hello, I'm Osama Bin Laden, and I'm glad I did 9-11. That's when I lost it. I said, listen to me, all of you people in this movie theater, you are all assholes. You have each personally contributed to me having the worst day of my life. Every one of you should be ashamed of yourselves because you ruined what was supposed to be a nice trip to the movie theater for me. My name is Daniel Henschel, and I want you to remember that name because one day you will see it in the news and you'll feel a sinking pit in your stomach when you realize the rest of what the headline says was your fault. Okay, so like I said, I really am very sorry about the delay in releasing another episode. This isn't an excuse, but it is an explanation. I did a live seminar last Friday, so one week ago yesterday, and that really consumed most of my time because I often wonder to myself at this place in my career, what do I do now that I pretty much have it all? I built my empire, I got catapulted into superstardom, I'm here in Hollywood, and now it's kind of like, okay, I've got more than 
what most people would even dare to dream of, and I'm only 27, so now what do I do? And that's sort of the predicament that I find myself in every day. And you can keep chugging along doing the same old crap your entire life, and that is what most people do, but you're not going to find the pot of gold at the end of the rainbow just by sitting on a picnic blanket. So... I got this opportunity to do my own show, and it was very fun. The theater was very nice. I was super grateful to the pest control company that they hired. I think they had around five exterminators get up on stage before me and make noise to kind of deter rats and deer and roaches and things from distracting the audience during my performance, which was very kind of them, and I have to give them credit. I didn't see a single pest the entire night, so they did a great job. Um, and I mean, what can I even say? It was such a high getting up there and seeing living, breathing people responding to my work because believe it or not, social media is actually very lonely. You might have millions of followers and I do, but at the end of the day, those are really just numbers on a screen. And I say this all the time. I may be number one. Yes, but one is the loneliest number after all. So It was very nice to see the bodies of some of my supporters. That was very rewarding to me in many ways. And I posted the entire lecture for you all on Patreon. Of course, it wasn't the live version, unfortunately. It was a version that I had recorded after the fact. But nevertheless, you can imagine for yourself how great it would have been to see it if you had taken the initiative to come like the people who actually do care about me. Yesterday in America, we celebrated something called Black Friday. And if you've never heard of it, at first you might think that it's a day of remembrance for when a blimp crashed into a children's hospital and killed everyone inside. But thankfully, it's actually a very nice holiday because it's one where we celebrate going to the store and buying stuff. And some people's first inclination when Black Friday comes to mind is to sort of dismay the cultural degradation that would lead to the birth of a holiday that's centered around buying stuff from the store. But I think ultimately that sentiment is of no use to us because America's culture of consumerism is just as valid as any other culture. Polish people just leave cabbage out on the windowsill for two months and they have the nerve to call that culture, why is going to Target as a recreational activity any different? Why isn't that valid as a cultural practice? So I say we reframe our perspective. The other day at Thanksgiving dinner, the topic came up of why are stores open on Thanksgiving? That's horrible. Everybody should be off work so they can spend time with their family like everybody else. And that's a nice concept, perhaps, in a fantasy novel for children where reality isn't a constraint, but in this world we live in, guess what? Nobody wants to go see their stupid family because they got kicked out of the house for being gay. So they pick up that extra shift at Whole Foods, getting overtime, by the way, so that you can run in the day of and get more cranberry sauce because your butler dropped it when you started beating him. My point is this. You can either look at a situation and say, okay, that really sucks, but I'm sure as hell not going to do anything about it. Or you can say, why should I do anything about it? Maybe it's fine after all. If you're not going to do anything about it anyway, and you know you won't, what difference does it make to anybody how you feel about it either way? The only way it makes a difference then is if you care about what other people think about what you think, and it doesn't. So yeah, happy Black Friday. All hail Commandant Jeff Bezos. This is my culture, and I'm proud of that. I'm proud that I've suggested going to Target as a date idea. I'm proud that my only meaningful memory from childhood is what the Pepsi logo looked like. That is just as valid as any other culture based in some horseshit pseudo-psychological concept like community or belonging. You don't need any of that stuff to be happy. If that were true, then every other user who subscribed to the Mommy Milker subreddit would have shot up a school by now. That's why I've made it my mission in life to single-handedly ruin therapy for an entire generation of children. Because therapy was a millennial con job from the very beginning. So you're welcome. 
The next segment of the show today, I'm calling Mailbag. Now, I don't normally publicly respond to people in my comment sections because, frankly, I don't think that they deserve it. And a lot of times when I get comments, they're really stupid. So I think to myself, what the fuck happens in a person's life that leads them to the point of typing something like this out and posting it publicly? But I do read the comments, and I want to make people feel heard. You all are paying good money for that type of thing, and I know that I can trust you with some of my more inner thoughts. One thing I do want to address that comes up a lot is the fact that I frequently delete things, especially on Twitter. People tend to bring that up there a lot. And here's what I'll say on that subject. To accrue a large following on Twitter, you must be deeply troubled on a personal level in some way. The act of posting on Twitter is a form of exhibitionist self-harm in many ways. When I post something on Twitter... It sets in motion a three-day odyssey where hundreds of thousands of random weirdos internalize what I have to say as if it's an attack on them personally. And they respond with the full weight of a lifetime of emotional trauma and the resulting maladaptive social behaviors. Now, a lot of times, I like when that happens. I think it's funny, but not all the time. Sometimes I tweet something kind of on a whim that I didn't think about very hard, and I really don't feel like carrying the burden of whatever some random freak has to say about it. So yeah, I delete stuff a lot. That doesn't mean I don't stand by what I said. It just means this isn't worth it for me right now. And I'll give you an example. The other day, I had a very disturbing and annoying interaction with some old woman. And if you've talked to me for even five seconds, you'll know that I hate old people. Just last night, I was screaming at an old person because they were driving so slow on the interstate, I wanted to blow my brains out. I think they were going like 70 miles an hour. And I almost found myself just wanting to hit and kill them with my car myself so that they would never inconvenience anyone ever again like they have to me. But I decided not to do that, and I opted instead for the far more peaceful solution of screaming every slur I could think of, and that satisfied me just fine. And normally, that's the extent of my interactions with old people. But this day was different. Somehow... This woman got my number. I don't know if she's some rabid fangirl of mine who stalked me and got my personal information. I sure hope not. But nevertheless, she texted me thinking that I was her grandson because, surprise, surprise, an old person with dementia. Who would have thought? And I told her straight up, I'm not your stupid goober grandson, so leave me the hell alone. She proceeded to invite me to her Thanksgiving dinner anyway, probably hoping that I would come so she could skin me alive and have me for dinner. Thankfully, I'm smarter than that. I said absolutely not. And I posted this interaction online thinking, you know, maybe we can dox this woman who's clearly unstable and dangerous and take her out of the equation somehow so she can't make any other innocent person feel uncomfortable. But then, of course... Because this is the liberal internet, I got canceled for what is probably the 40th time this month. I'll read you some of the actual abuse that I got for this. I hope your food has fucking botulism in it and you go to the hospital for it, you heartless loser. I'm going to give this person the benefit of the doubt and assume they're talking about the old woman who harassed me. Kill yourself, of course, I get that one a lot. Leave that poor old woman alone. This is rude, mean, and unfunny. This is the type of thing that would make Ricky Gervais laugh, someone said, which I thought was a strange reference. You thought you ate. Um, I think God should kill you. I'm tripping and this is freaking me out. You get the idea here. Now, these were all from Twitter. And I used to give Twitter a lot of credit. This isn't so much true anymore these days, but... The people there at least had some sort of baseline intelligence, and their fatal flaw was that they were so hopelessly bitter that they were incapable of ever having a genuine connection with a human being. 
But at least that's a more nuanced problem than how does this person even tie their shoes, which tends to be my reaction on Instagram. This is not an exaggeration. I lost 2,000 followers on Instagram for this post. I'm not even gonna read any of the Instagram comments because I think the amount of brain cells that would kill could be ethically considered a homicide. And at the end of the day, it's not even worth it because something you should keep in mind whether your following is big or small, is that a normal, well-adjusted person does not comment on a random stranger's post. It's very easy to feel like the comments are representative of a general consensus, when in reality, the comments are nothing more than the random ramblings of lunatics. When a normal person sees a post and reacts positively to it, they probably aren't gonna comment. They might not even actually like the post itself. And it's so important to remember that. The comments do not work like Rotten Tomatoes. Sometimes I scroll through my comments and I panic and think to myself, oh, wait a minute, am I in the wrong here? But then I remember, it's like when people leave a review for a restaurant, usually that's because something bad happened. The people who had a good experience typically just forget about it and they don't feel the urge to act on their response. I know that most people agreed with how I handled the grandma situation rationally. I know that. I know most people who saw the post would agree that that woman is a total freak and anybody in that situation would respond the way that I did. I've been pretty lucky lately. I haven't been as active, so I haven't really gotten embroiled in as many controversies as I typically do. It seems like these days, no matter what I do, some random crazy person completely misinterprets what I'm trying to say and takes it way out of context, but what some random crazy person thinks isn't my problem. And I resent when people refer to my insights on the internet as bait, because what is that supposed to mean? Do you really think that the reason I'm expressing myself is purely for your reaction? Don't flatter yourself. I don't give a shit what your reaction is. This is about me. It always has been and it always will be. I got on the internet because I wanted to help people. That has never changed and that never will change. So just remember, as we move forward into the future here, if there's one thing I want you to take away from this episode, it's I am a good person. Everything I do is because I'm trying to make your life better in the way that I know I can. If you misinterpret my intentions or my actions, that's your problem. I have no control over that. I don't have control over the fact that your life sucks and now you have to ratio me to feel like you're worth something. Don't try to take me down to pull yourself up because I'll pull both of us up if you just trust me enough to hold my hand and do as I say. Okay, well, that's the end of this episode. Thanks, everybody, for everything. You are the best. I hope you have a wonderful weekend. Merry Christmas. <laughs> it's officially the Christmas season, so I know I'm excited. I hope you are too, and I'll talk to you again very soon. Bye-bye. <laughs>